June 6, 1944, D-Day. The naval bombardment at H hour began the invasion of Europe, but the assault actually began hours earlier during the night when 19,000 Allied soldiers parachuted and glided into Normandy. This is the story of the first French town liberated in the invasion and of Simone Renault, an ordinary yet extraordinary French woman who gave her life in the ensuing decades to honor the Americans who gave their lives in days, or sometimes in minutes. Because of her untiring efforts to comfort the bereaved loved ones of these fallen soldiers, Simone Renault became known as the Mother of Normandy. Simone Renault was born in the small farm village of saint germain de ternebout in 1899, the only daughter of Paul and Cécile Cornier. They led a simple, modest life. Simone's father had once been a servant of the great playwright Edmund Rostand, who famously brought to the stage Cyrano de Bergerac. The Rostands were a profound influence on young Simone, a second family of sorts. They helped cultivate her love of language, education, and the literary arts. As a teenager, Simone had gone off to study in England and taught French there before moving to Paris to attend college. And it was in the City of Lights the Rostands kept close watch over young Simone. In 1923, the Normandy farm girl fell in love with a studious young veteran of the Great War, Alexander Renault. Of all his characteristics, interests, and education, nothing was more central to the man, Alexander Renault, than his experience as a soldier in the French army. The First World War had broken out in 1914, just as Alexander was finishing his two years of compulsory military duty. The war dictated that he would stay in the French army and fight four more years past his required time. Alexander Renault had fought in some of the war's ugliest episodes, including the horrific Battle of Verdun that claimed the lives of more than 250,000 men on both sides. 90% of the soldiers in his unit were killed during the war, and he might have been too, if not for the mercy of his enemies. Near the end of an ill-fated assault during one battle late in the war, Lieutenant Renault became trapped in his trench when a door frame collapsed on his leg. Two German soldiers approached him and chose to take him prisoner rather than shoot him on the spot. He was held captive until the war ended six months later. He was not a guy sitting in a, 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 behind a desk in Paris. He was a frontline soldier with a machine gun platoon. He started as a simple soldier, then became a sergeant, then became a lieutenant. My father was a very modest person, very low key, you know. He would never put himself in front. He said, I became an officer because everybody else was killed. As a matter of fact, out of 60 men of his area, they came back only for alive. The fact is that living through this war from 1914 until he was taken prisoner in 1917, to survive was a pure miracle. The highly decorated combat officer then re-entered civilian life, grateful to have survived, and calm in his belief that life could deal him no greater challenge than he'd already faced. He had already earned multiple college degrees and was studying to become a pharmacist when their relationship began. Soon after they were married in 1923, the couple searched for a place to settle down and raise a family. By chance, they heard about a small pharmacy for sale in saint mary no more than 10 kilometers from Simone's birthplace. They bought the business, moved there, and began building a quiet, happy life of running the local pharmacy and making a home. They had three sons, Paul, Henri Jean and Maurice. And Simone devoted herself to her community and family. We were always surrounded with lots of animals. As a matter of fact, she was the head of the Humane Society for the area of St. Mary Glees. She was raising hell every time she saw something done to an animal. She rapidly developed a reputation as a woman of piercing conviction and leadership when it came to the causes she believed in. Education was one of those causes. The Renault boys were expected to excel in school and learn to speak in languages other than French. It was like, like a tradition that we had to learn English. My older brother did learn English very well. He was speaking quite fluently in 1944, to the point where he was used as an interpreter with the American army. They were expected to embrace the same thirst for knowledge and multicultural understanding that had made their father, the son of a middle-class grain dealer, into an avid reader 
writer, and 20th century Renaissance man. My father had a deep culture, deep culture especially in, in Latin, Greek, and, uh, and French. An impeccably dressed man of sobriety, confidence, and good humor, Alexander Renault was well liked and respected in Saint Maraglis. He served as assistant mayor until he was elected mayor of the town during the German occupation in March 1944. In late May 1944, the Nazi war machine dominating Europe was overstretched and fighting on many fronts. Supply lines were strained to the breaking point. However, the ports and fields of England stretched at the seams with an enormous buildup of men, material, and weapons. Everyone knew the invasion would come, but no one knew when or where the attack would come. Most thought it would come at Calais, the closest point to England. They were assisted in this belief by cleverly planted Allied news releases, phantom armies, and covert leaks of battle plans, all intended to deceive the German high command. None other than the Desert Fox General Erwin Rommel was tasked with constructing the German so-called Atlantic Wall to secure Fortress Europe in France and repel the inevitable Allied invasion. In places, Rommel did his job well, constructing horrific killing zones as witnessed by the slaughter of men on Omaha Beach. But making hundreds of miles of shorelines impregnable was a task only a man such as Adolf Hitler thought possible. The Germans prepared for the imminent Allied invasion by ordering the townspeople to strip logs from the forests to be arranged in the fields and stand as obstacles in the event of air landings. The Frenchmen called the structures Rommel's Candles. The Germans and the villagers also dug trenches and planted mine-topped posts during low tide along the coastal beaches. But the Germans and Normans alike worked without great urgency doubtful that their sleepy corner of France would ever be selected as the point of attack in an Allied breakthrough of Europe. As the German occupation continued into its fourth full year, Madame Renault became withdrawn. Her passion for life had gradually slipped into a sullen disdain of the occupying force. She spent many hours alone in her room, frightened and distressed about the future of her family. How could the Renault family and the residents of Saint-Marie-Glis know that the events on the night of June 5th would change history and their lives forever? And that Simone Renault's compassion would bring France and America together? As my father was a mayor of saint marie glise he was often speaking with a German because uh, they come to the town hall and they ask to have bicycles, they ask to have horses, they ask to have food. My father tried every time to give less. They has to have 10 bicycles. He, 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 he said, no, it's not possible. We can only give you four or five. It was all time a uh, struggle between the German authorities and my father. For the residents of saint marie those struggles would come to an end as the Allied forces prepared a surprise attack against the occupying forces. Don Lassen, a paratrooper from the 82nd Airborne, recalls. Before we take off for an invasion, the last thing they do is have chaplain services, you know, church services. And uh, they take the guys, the Protestant guys over here and the Catholic guys over there. And if the Jewish guys, uh, they had a rabbi somewhere. And our chaplain uh, told us, you know, he said, now listen, I want to tell you guys something. When you get in that plane, and, and right to step out that door, just remember the last words of Jesus on the cross. Father, into thy hands I commit my spirit. And he said, just keep that in mind. What I appreciated was, he didn't say, because you came to church now, you guys are gonna make it. He didn't tell us that. He said, some of you are not gonna make it, but you have to keep this message in your mind because you're fighting for what's right, see? And uh, that was our, our words of encouragement. When we got into those planes, we had so much junk in our pockets and around us. We had two bandoliers, one over each shoulder and one around our waist, and K rations and grenades and everything that went with it. So uh, we get in those seats, and that's very uncomfortable, and you can't do anything because they're, they're, uh, they're not real roomy because you got as many guys in that plane as it'll hold. When you feel those wheels leave the ground, you had it because you're not coming back. <laughs> That in that plane. 
Nobody was sitting there crying or worrying about getting home or anything else. We were just, we were just living today for what today was and, and take, it, take it as it comes, one minute at a time. So then we flew across that channel. The Krauts, they cut loose. Boy, the anti-aircraft was bursting around us and, uh, and the airplane was rocking and rolling. You had to hold on to the side of the plane because when you get the green light, everybody gets out of that plane as fast as they can go. As we came over San Silver, we started getting a considerable amount of flack. Uh, ACAC -ac from German ACAC -ac unit that had moved in to San Silver and we were down low coming over the channel. We had come up to about 600 feet and found that at that altitude there were clouds. We were in clouds, out of clouds. Some of the aircraft went down below to stay in the clear. Others went above to stay in the clear above the cloud. So it, it, it contributed to a lot of dis basically built-in dispersion as far as the air column was concerned. Technically, when you jump, they're supposed to slow that plane down to about 125 miles an hour and then lift the tail a little bit to make sure you don't get hung up on it, and then you jump. Well, this plane was going as fast as that C-47 could go because he was in trouble. They were really shooting the sky uh, apart around him and you could hear the shrapnel going through the wings and pushing all around you, and you're holding on, you know, trying to get out of that plane. Well, he was going, I uh, was going at least 150 miles an hour, and the opening shock was pow! And it, it knocked me goofy. I mean, it was just such a tremendous shock that I got. And I hit the ground, I was, I was unconscious when I hit the ground. And then, and then when I woke up, there's tracers going over my head, <laughs> and guns are popping all around me. The surprise the planners hoped for was ruined in saint marie Every Frenchman and German alike were in the town square to fight a fire. We did not know yet what was going on, while a good part of the population of saint marie église was out on the farther side of the square striving to extinguish the fire in the burning house. And while the fire alarm sounded in sad and hurried tones from the steeple of our old church, like in the old times, we gazed up, and what did we see? We saw clearly in the moonlight something like enormous confetti coming out by hundreds and hundreds from the bellies of the C-47s. We could see paratroopers fall everywhere around us. It was, uh, you know, it was kind of a hectic situation. And, and John landed on the church, and Cliff landed in this guy's yard. They were they were killing guys left and right, and especially those that landed in the town. So as he was landing, he was shot in the foot by German machine gun fire. He tried to cut himself down, tried to cut the parachute harness on and drop, which would have been about a 35-foot drop. He, uh, he dropped his knife and was, was stuck there. So he decided to play dead. He played dead for the rest of the, of the night and, and was there to witness all of these things that were happening. Madame Renault, her sons, and the people of saint marie were transfixed, watching history unfold before them. The trembling children huddled close to the adults as gunfire erupted in the town square. Stay close and pray. The night was warm with the bright moonlight, and the wind blew violently at times. I still hear the bursts of explosions shaking the earth. D-Day was upon them. The American paratroopers had only begun their descent into Nazi hell, and into the heart of Simone Renault of saint marie Normandy, the greatest invasion ever undertaken. Here, the Coast Guard manned attack transport Bayfield served as flagship off Utah Beach. At H hour, landing craft hit the beaches, the beginning of the bloody road to Berlin. On June 6, 1944, the invasion was proceeding, and the battle was raging. Men were dying by the thousands. But back home in America, no one knew anything about their loved ones. Was my husband, son, father, grandson, or friend among the living or the dead? The anxiety was palpable. 
penetrating and painful. In every great crisis, wealth, rank, education, or position counted for naught. Only God knew. And to God the nation turned as one. President Roosevelt addressed a somber yet anxious nation over the radio on D-Day, leading them in a prayer to the Almighty. My fellow Americans, in this poignant hour, I ask you to join with me in prayer. Almighty God, our sons, pride of our nation, this day have set upon a mighty endeavor, a struggle to preserve our republic, our religion, and our civilization, and to set free a suffering humanity. Lead them straight and true. Give strength to their arms, stoutness to their hearts, steadfastness in their faith. They will need thy blessings. Their road will be long and hard. Meanwhile, in saint mary the death and terror were all too real to the Renault family. You see these poor guys coming from California, or from Texas, or from Montana, or from New York. I am Alfred Aaron Rosenthal. I lived in Brooklyn, New York. I am Robert R. Kelly, United States Army. I came from Findlay, Ohio. My parents are Mr. and Mrs. James E. Kelly. The guys were 18, 19, 20 years old landing in a foreign land where they don't know anybody for something which is not absolutely their real problem, and they would get killed right there or they would get wounded. I mean, it was absolutely terrible. I mean, you got to realize what it is. Such a fantastic bravery and uh, dedication from this man, you know, to sacrifice their life for us that we have to remember. The townspeople of San Mariglis were caught in the crossfire with no safe place to hide. Sixty residents of the town were killed in the furious battle. The Renault family and others fled to a ditch outside of town. My mother was sitting in one place and then she moved a, a little further and a, a, a lady who was our neighbor came to sit to her exactly the position where she was sitting. And as soon as she got there, she received a shrapnel right in her heart and she was killed on the spot. She was dead instantly. So right at the place where my mother was. There were about 19,000 paratroopers who descended either in gliders, and, and, and many of them did, or jumped from airplanes, from C-47 uh, sky trains, the British call them Dakotas. They had to stop the prospect of the German reinforcements coming from, uh, from Normandy, from inland, to the beaches. And if we had been stopped, the Allies had been stopped on the beaches of Normandy at Omaha and Gold and Sword in Utah, the, the whole fate of the Normandy invasion and, and Operation Overlord would have been in jeopardy. And the Germans had opened up um, dikes which were, and dams which were uh, centuries old. And the area was completely flooded so that many of the paratroopers dropped into water uh, just a few feet deep, but they had this tremendous amount of equipment on, as much as 80 to 100 pounds or more uh, equipment that they jumped with, and it dragged them down and, they, and many of them drowned, or they were lost in, in addition to being disoriented. But the paratroopers were there to protect not only the western flank of the, of the Normandy invasion, the 82nd Airborne was to capture St. Mary Gleis. Uh, St. Mary Gleis was important uh, to, uh, to the invasion because the Germans had an anti-aircraft battery situated there. And, and uh, they it, it made a little bastion out of the town. And it was important that we take this town to clear this area for the roads that were coming through. St. Mary Gleis was a key town in the whole Normandy Peninsula because the Germans had forces in Cherbourg to the north. They had forces to saint sauveur le vicon that we'd just come over, where they'd moved in about a matter of a two or three days before we had come. We originally were going to jump on saint sauveur and they moved us to St. Mary Lee. 
if we jumped over there, we'd, we'd have had a really tough time. But the, so the Germans that were in Sassover would have come, th have to come through St. Mary Glees. It was a, it was a road junction. I heard something. Well, I had my cricket, see, and I, I had, of course, retrieved my cricket when I, when I set out for the, uh, for the hedgerow, and uh, I heard something. And of course, I was prone. I'm laying on the ground. Got my rifle. Uh, and I heard, I heard something sound like somebody moving. He's making noise and I'm not, so I know he's there. And he doesn't know I'm there. <clears throat> so I, I let him get a little bit closer and I cricked my cricket once. And only, only the guys that made that invasion at that particular time knew what the cricket was. You see, if it was a German, he wouldn't have known what it was. He figured it out in a few hours, but we were the first guys in there, see? And uh, so this guy heard it, and he cricked his cricket back. Now, I'm going to tell you what. If he hadn't cricked his cricket back, that son of a bitch would have been dead because <laughs> I wouldn't have given him a second chance. It was around 2 or 3 o'clock in the afternoon, the gliders come in. Here comes his C-47 pulling the gliders through the air. They let those gliders go over our head. Well, they were fairly high when they released them, and they were circling, trying to find a landing area. And I, I think almost every glider that landed around us cracked up because the fields were not large enough, but it, they were coming in so fast that by the time they touched ground, they were halfway through the field, and they couldn't get rid of their momentum until they hit that hedgerow at the other end of the field. And tail went up in the air and the nose down, and and uh, it was just full of casualties there. You know, we were pulling guys out of every every glider. These glider pilots, by the way, did an excellent job. As a, they were very much underrated. They were, they were told, you just ride a glider in there, and we'll evacuate you back. No, you just fly in, land on the field, and come on. Well, they land on the field, except they found it was a long way from that edge of that field to, to any boat taking them back to England. The Renault family and the townspeople hunkered down for nearly two days with no food or water, while some of the bloodiest small arms battles in the history of warfare were being fought all around the town, at places like Lafayette Bridge, where German soldiers gunned down waves of Americans in a furious effort to hold ground and maintain control of their supply routes. But the Americans kept coming battling their way through the swampy, mosquito-infested fields, across an elevated causeway, body over body, eventually overpowering the better-positioned Germans. When U.S. tanks, Sandy from Utah Beach, began rumbling into town, the villagers realized the Germans had been defeated. Their town was liberated. When we heard the tanks coming, the noise, especially the tanks on the road, we knew at that moment it was at the end of a not of the war, but at the end of our, uh, the tragedy, because we had the help from the troops coming from the sea. Soon, the jeeps and ambulances followed, carrying the bodies of American soldiers killed and wounded in the beach landings and parachute drops. The Renault family watched in awestruck reverence as they came, load after load, to be treated for wounds or buried. Madame Renault pulled her family together and spoke two words, never forget. I speak for the immense majority of Frenchmen when I say that we have not forgotten, that we do not forget now, that we will never forget. These words would become the Renault family's lifelong mantra. And that morning, Simone Renault made caring for the graves of these soldiers and their American families her life's mission. In the immediate aftermath of D-Day, as soldiers, tanks and jeeps float up from the beaches to the first town liberated in the war, so too came the fallen. Local townspeople watched in silent reverence as load after load of dead GIs, bullet riddled and caked in blood and sand, passed slowly along the narrow streets. Their young lives had been cut short. Simone Renault stood alongside her sons and peered through the window as the dead flowed into saint mary the scene entered her soul and transformed her entire life. Sympathy, compassion, maternity, and foremost, a stunned sense of honor overcame her in waves, like the American soldiers who kept coming, unit after unit, to save her people. 
As battles were still raging across Normandy, all of her impulses and emotions fell into formation inside her. To her, the mission was clear. She would spend the rest of her life fulfilling it. Simone Renault's passion for life, which had been dormant during the years of German occupation, was revived by a mission she took upon herself to welcome all the soldiers who stopped by her pharmacy and to care for the graves of the American soldiers. Among the American soldiers who stopped in at the Renault's pharmacy shortly after D-Day was a major from California, Henry Morrow, the only son of a widow from Tucson, Arizona, and the father of an 11-year-old only child, a daughter named Joanne. Less than a month after Major Morrow came ashore at Omaha Beach, he was shot while on patrol. He died 40 minutes later. When my father died, he was doing re reconnaissance uh, near Picoville, and actually he, that's where he died and was taken to a hospital there, which is very close to San, uh, San Mariglis. Young Joanne was at their family's home in Santa Barbara, California, when the news arrived. The Western Union came to our house. I mean, the telegram came to our house. My grandmother happened to be there, and all, uh, that was all, just my grandmother and my mother and myself. I, uh, I think I was just in shock. I, I just couldn't believe that that was true, and I thought, oh, there must be some mistake, and I don't believe this, and all. Uh, my grandmother was inconsolable, and my mother also, so that was very traumatic and very stressful for me. Marguerite Morrow, the Major's mother, was very close to her son and had written dozens of letters to him while he was in England staging for D-Day. His post-invasion death, after he'd survived the treacherous beach landings, consumed her with grief and desperation half a world away. She wrote a letter addressed to the only person she could think of. Families from America wrote letters and uh, sent it not to Monsieur Renault or Mrs. Renault, they don't know them, but on the, on the envelope it, it was right, Mr. Mayor, Sat Mary Glees, and um, my father received many, many letters in the, at the town hall, and uh, he, he was very busy, uh, so he gave these letters to my mother, she was in charge of it, and uh, on this letter, it was all time the same thing, the same story. And uh, the people say, uh, Mr. Mayor, we know that uh, our son had been killed in St. Mary's or around St. Mary's. is uh, buried in the, the American cemetery in St. Mary's. Uh, please, can you give information because the uh, army don't give information about that. So my, my mother, uh, going to the to the cemetery and uh, she has to the intendant where is the grave of uh, Mr. M Mr. Moreau. Or... She gone on the grave. She took a picture. She put flowers and uh, she developed the film and she sent it to the to the mother with a with a petal of rose or something like that. And uh, when your son is died. 7,000 kilometers ago, you don't realize, you, you, you need to have something uh, material. Five weeks after landing on Utah Beach, General Theodore Roosevelt Jr. suffered a fatal heart attack and was buried at San Mariglis. A memorial service was held at General Roosevelt's hometown in Oyster Bay, New York, which Life magazine covered. They also assigned a young staff photographer named Ralph Morse, the task of finding Roosevelt's grave in St. Mariglis. Mr. Morse traveled there and met Madame Simone Renault, who knew exactly where he was buried. Ralph Morse, now 92 years of age, was surprised and delighted to learn of all the comfort that had stemmed from his photograph. One picture I took in the war has been used now for 65 years, and it's still going on. I said, can you believe that? Was I did 50 years of American history. That's in every textbook, every encyclopedia. This was one of these little stories you do because they're important little stories. They're the Ernie Pyle kind of story of, of, of in pictures that are words. In August 1944, Life magazine published his photograph of Simone Renault placing a bouquet on the grave of General Theodore Roosevelt Jr. 
This image sent a message around the world that France was deeply grateful for the Allied sacrifices of World War II. In the hearts of these grieving families, his photograph gave them something tangible and physical to hold on to, an image of hope. She, with a caption, covered the whole day because everyone thought that she was the important part. I loved the idea of the mayor's wife putting flowers. That's how this started. But she did not do that only for General Roosevelt. She did it for all, any, any soldier who was killed. I mean, it, it was not a matter of the rank, you know. And she did it for uh, dozens and dozens of soldiers. And she was bringing flowers, so she, uh, taking a picture and sending these pictures to the families, which felt a little, uh, you know, recomfort to, 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 to have somebody who would take care of the grave locally, you know, so I, I think it was very emotional for them. It also sent a message that galvanized thousands of grieving American mothers and families. In the uncertainty of the fog of war, pierced only by the certainty of crushing grief, here was a face, a person, a mother, who cared for and honored the graves of their fallen sons. Well, if you were a mother of a kid that was killed in Normandy, and you're in South Dakota, you're a farmer, you can't just pack up and go to St. Mary Glees. She, she opened a, a, a method of you being in touch with your child, your dead child. Heartfelt and tear-stained letters began to pour into St. Mary Glees. They came by the armloads, no longer addressed to the mayor, but to Madame Renault. And to her eternal credit, she dutifully replied to each one enclosing photos of the area, perhaps some soil from around the gravesite, flower petals and poems she had written. She would arrive every day at the post office in St. Maryglise to pick up the daily batch of letters and go to work. And every day, she would send more personal letters back to America. She was sending like at least 30 or 40 letters every day. In the summer of 1944, the job of recovering and burying the dead was urgent. Three cemeteries were designated in and around St. Maryglise. As bodies were collected over the months, the cemeteries filled with nearly 15,000 fallen troops, nearly 10 times the living population of the town. Simple white crosses and stars of David made of wood bore the names and serial numbers of those who gave their lives. Every day, Madame Renault walked through the war-battered town to the newly turned earth of the cemeteries, usually with one of her sons in tow, to pay respects and to assure that the grounds were properly maintained. Madame Renault and her sons were soon spending most of their days searching for names and graves in the cemeteries. And in the evening, she closed her bedroom door and tapped away on an old red German-made typewriter, performing an intimate act of gratitude, honor, and love for all the boys who died so hers could be free. She treated the memories of the fallen U.S. soldiers as if they were her own sons. What she did was so unusual. No one expected the mayor's wife to be putting flowers on American graves for some kid in, in Mississippi whose mother's asked her to do it. No one ever dreamt of it. I wish to say that the deeds of these historical soldiers, like Major Henry Morrow, are engraved forever in our hearts in grateful remembrance. They and their families may be assured of our unlimited gratitude and deep affection. It was this saintly maternal devotion continuing throughout her life that earned Simone Renaud the appellation, the mother of Normandy. Madame Renault urgently took it upon herself to coordinate local volunteer efforts to care for three makeshift cemeteries that were installed in and around St. Maryglise. She divided up sections among other townspeople, and with her children in tow, she tended lovingly to each grave, laying down flowers before the wooden markers, clutching handfuls of earth and renewing her commitment. As the years passed and others moved on with their lives, she remained vigilant. As the decades passed, her hands withered and her steps slowed, but her sense of personal obligation drew stronger. If she could help it, not one American family would ever wonder if the death of a son, a brother, a husband or father at Normandy had been in vain. And she would not let her fellow countrymen forget it either. 
Her days at the grave sites were followed by long hours alone behind closed doors, writing letters and poems to comfort those who shared her love of American soldiers and imploring top officials in France and the United States to keep the event fresh and accurate in history's memory. Her words would reach veterans, generals, and presidents. Her words would turn enmity into empathy. They would help a war-torn world heal, and they would honor a time and place where good prevailed over evil. As soon as it was safe to travel to Europe again, Marguerite Morrow of Tucson, Arizona, came to San Maraglis to find her son's grave and to meet the woman who had written so often to her. A flamboyant former drama instructor at the University of Arizona, Mrs. Morrow made an unforgettable impact. She came across the Atlantic with a pink Cadillac. When she arrived in St. Mary Glees, that was like in 1947, was the biggest sensation in the town, a pink Cadillac. We never saw that. I mean, it was like coming from the moon, you know? Mrs. Morrow spent nearly nine months in Normandy, attending to her son's grave, helping out at a local nursing home, and giving occasional rides to townspeople in her lavish American car. She stayed at a convent that the mayor had arranged for. But other than that, she went daily to my father's grave. And her sole purpose of going to France, really, and to saint mary Glace, was uh, to be with my father as much time as she could. And I know that she went and she read, uh, would sit and, uh, at his grave and read, and uh, would talk, you know, read poems to him and read different passages and things to him and uh, really uh, spent a great deal of time there. Uh, the devotion that Madame Renault had um, shown as far as her willingness, and both the Renaults really, and the willingness to decorate the graves and their appreciation for uh, the liberation of uh, France and the first village or town that was liberated was uh, very important to my grandmother also, and so that was a bond that really developed, a tremendous bond. Madame Renault and Mrs. Morrow soon became like sisters. They shared fluency in each other's home language, a love of poetry, and above all, a reverence for what happened in Normandy on D-Day. To Madame Renault, Mrs. Morrow was the face of all grieving American families. By the time of Mrs. Morrow's visit, Simone Renault was spending up to 10 hours a day at the typewriter, trying to keep up with all the letters from those who'd lost loved ones in the invasion. In 1948, word soon came from the U.S. War Department that the United States had decided to remove the graves from St. Maraglis and either repatriate them or relocate them to a new, bigger cemetery about 30 kilometers away from St. Maraglis at a site overlooking Omaha Beach. Madame Renault, who had devoted herself, her family, her community, and her heart to the American cemeteries in saint mary could not believe the news. Her bewilderment soon turned to outrage. She and her husband would not let the cemeteries go without a fight, and she went straight to the top. Her next set of letters were not to grieving parents, but to the highest authorities in the U.S. military. She wrote letters to Generals Eisenhower, Gavin, and Ridgway imploring them to demand that the cemeteries stay where they were. She asked if just one of the three cemeteries could remain in St. Maraglis. The answer was no. Madame Renault did not, however, let her frustration over Washington's decision break her will. She continued to tend to the graves at Omaha Beach and to write to American families and veterans, most of whose addresses she came to know by heart. The new cemetery location made her devotion difficult. The war had left St. Maraglis in ruins. During the occupation, the Germans had robbed the peninsula of resources, from crops to horses to cars. The military battles of 1944 had shattered homes, farms, and businesses, devastated roadways, and ripped out utilities. Two years would pass before power was fully restored. Schools were mangled. Vehicles, fuel, and money all were scarce as Europe entered its long, strenuous recovery. So it was uh, very tough years after the war. Uh, you know, time to rebuild, and uh, it takes it, you, it wouldn't have happened in six months. It took at least 10 or 15 years, and lots of people were suffering. 
Ralph Morse's photograph in Life magazine had caught the attention of Locust Valley, New York, an upper crust community near the Roosevelt family estate on Sagamore Hill. The image of Madame Renault placing flowers on the grave of the famed Brigadier General, the son of a former president, deeply affected a local veteran who had jumped into Normandy with the 82nd Airborne Division. Colonel Augustin Hart knew firsthand the condition of France after the war. He and a consortium of civic organizations under the direction of a local woman named Martha Breasted decided on Thanksgiving 1947 to launch a sister city relief program between Locust Valley and saint marie It was an idea that would eventually spread across America in a program called Operation Democracy. This was a grassroots initiative to augment the Marshall Plan by pairing U.S. towns and cities with French counterparts. Ordinary American citizens banded together to collect needed goods and send them overseas to a sister city in France. More than 200 communities in the United States participated in Operation Democracy, and it sprang from the goodness and generosity of Americans. It was a godsend for Normandy. Within months, the first of many shipments of goods began arriving. And as a kid, it was engraved in my memory that uh, Locust Valley was a fantastic city because they were sending us all these goodies and, and clothing and stuff for, for the schools uh, and even, uh, I think, uh, some medical equipment. So Locust Valley was a great help. We really appreciate what they did. The relationship between the two towns continued to flourish through the post-war recovery years. Maurice remembers that whenever a new Operation Democracy shipment arrived, it was like Christmas. Madame Renault wrote a poem of gratitude to the New York town. Among its stanzas, which are now engraved on a monument in the town center of Locust Valley, is this. Never can we forget your kindly aid. Our children raise their hands for you in prayer. The more because our sons with you are laid in Norman earth together sleeping there. Madame Renault was invigorated by the generosity from the people of Locust Valley. It compelled her to diligently write letters and poetry to American families. The correspondence of gratitude continued to pour in from the United States. I wish that I could express in writing what comfort you have given me, knowing that you are going to visit my beloved son, talking to him and praying with him as I would do. God bless you. Most gracious lady, you are probably closer to us than any other person in this world because you are so near physically and spiritually to our son. The letters which you send, my dear wife, are so full of warm love, they melt our hearts. We long to grip your hands and gaze into your eyes with messages that no words can convey. I know there are many dear graves with the simple white crosses in the cemetery, but I always had the feeling our darling's grave was lonely in a faraway land until your first and wonderful letter came to us. In the weeks, months, and years to come, the Renault Pharmacy became known as a local embassy for American soldiers and French gratitude. Many of the great generals of the European campaign, Dwight Eisenhower, Matthew Ridgway, James Gavin, and Theodore Roosevelt Jr. among them, ultimately passed through St. Marie and most of them found their way to the pharmacy signed the guest book, and joined the Renaults for a meal or a glass of champagne or wine. Rank-and-file soldiers were equally welcome, any time. Madame Renault took great delight whenever any American soldier, and later any American veteran, paid a visit to the town that was from that point forward recognized as Kilometer Zero in the Allied March to Victory. Mayor Alexander Renault, when he was not occupied with what would become a 15-year project to rebuild his town, also was writing. His book, saint Mary D-Day, 6 June 1944, was a personal account of the invasion that remained on the France bestseller list for three years following its publication in 1945. The same year, Madame Renault helped organize the first annual anniversary observance of D-Day, with a small parade before a handful of veterans and Normandy villagers in the war-torn town. Someday, they will come back, uh, meaning they, the veterans. I'm sure of it. Their memories will bring them back. Like the first time C-47 planes bring them and their pals. And perhaps 
Will they drop flowers picked the day before in the United States over the cemeteries like multi-colored parachutes? His words would prove prophetic. We all have, since that unforgettable, immortal night and forever, a sacred debt towards these sons of America. Madame Renault and the mayor began recognizing the anniversary of the D-Day invasion in 1945, mere weeks after Allied forces took Berlin and well before the war was over in the Pacific Theater. By then, she had already assembled young children she called the Little Parachutists to perform in military costume and parade in the streets before small gatherings of veterans and townspeople. In the years immediately following the war, Madame Renault continued to entertain her American friends as they trickled into Normandy to revisit the experience and to pay respects to fallen comrades. Among them were some of the greatest generals of the war, including former Supreme Allied Commander General and U.S. President Dwight Eisenhower. We had the little paratroopers, of which I was part of when I was a kid. We were nine, ten years old. Uh, we would dress like uh, little American paratroopers. We had some kind of uniforms which were made like military uniforms and not very accurate. The only accurate thing was the American helmet. Uh, which was much too large for our heads, but which we still used. And we had some kind of guns made of wood, which looked uh, not at all like the American guns, but it was fun. So we would make, we would be like 12 or 13, and uh, I was the uh, chief commander of this, uh, <laughs> of these terrible fighters. And we would, uh, parade in the town with the, uh, with the veterans and so on, and we had the 82nd badge on our shoulders, so they were very pleased to see us and take a lot of pictures and things like that. For us, it was a lot of fun. I remember uh, in my father's book, St. Mary Glees, uh, there is a picture with uh, President Eisenhower coming to St. Mary Glees, and I'm shaking a hand with him and with another fellow friend and I'm dressed as a little paratrooper. It's a great memory for me. Madame Renault independently assured that the great battle would be remembered every June 6th in Normandy. And while she continued to visit the grave sites of fallen young heroes, she never stopped writing to families in America, building hundreds of permanent bonds. Veterans of the invasion would return from time to time as the years passed, and she and the mayor would make sure they were appropriately honored and entertained. She created a special organization to plan and produce annual commemorations in Normandy, the Association for Veterans of America, which ultimately laid the groundwork for a D-Day museum in St. Mariglise, arranged battle reenactments, placed historical plaques, and built a modest tourism industry around French gratitude for American sacrifice during World War II. Inside the first two decades after the war, the efforts had modest results, but she kept the memory alive. Then, in 1959, the story of the little town and its place in history became known around the world. I came home from the war with the names and addresses of almost everybody that had been in the battalion. And do you know, Cornelius Ryan, when he wrote The Longest Day, he contacted the 82nd Association for the, for the names and addresses of people because he wanted to write it on the basis of personal experiences. And they didn't have it. They referred him to me, and Cornelius Ryan contacted me and asked me for a, for a copy of, uh, of my names and addresses. And I said, okay, and I sat down and typed him out a copy of, I don't know well, how many I had then, probably a couple hundred at that point. And uh, I sent him a copy of all those names and addresses, and he then sent questionnaires to all those people and that's where he got the story of John Steele in the steeple, you know, and Colonel Vanderborten and broken leg and, and a few things like that, and, and he, he put them in his book. Well, if you look in the acknowledgments at the back of the book, you'll see that he acknowledges the help that I gave him in writing that book. The critically acclaimed work of literary nonfiction recounted the entire D-Day operation, from the tedious preparations and false starts in England to the parachute drops on St. Marglis and the deadly beach landings. 
printed in 26 different languages, millions of copies were sold around the world. It remains one of literature's most definitive treatments of the invasion. Two years after the book was finished, Hollywood came to Normandy. In 1961, some of the film industry's biggest stars, Henry Fonda, John Wayne, Robert Ryan, and Rod Steiger among them, arrived in France to film what would become an Academy Award-winning 1962 movie adapted from Ryan's book. It was a $10 million blockbuster film that ranked as the most costly black and white movie ever made until 1993's Schindler's List. And of course, this did actually put uh, St. Marie on the map and everybody from, from that time remember so much the uh, scene with the John Steele hanging from the steeple, which is a classic. The St. Marie story unfolded further before worldwide audiences in 1963, when famed CBS News anchorman Walter Cronkite accompanied Eisenhower back to Normandy to tape a special report to honor the 20th anniversary of D-Day. Eisenhower recollected the days leading up to the invasion and the bloody battles that soon followed. He crossed the channel and walked the beaches, and he took a seat on a bench outside the church on the town square and conducted a unique interview with his friend, Madame Renault. <laughs> and I, I am glad that you tell me, General, why you chose this uh, little town of yeah. saint mary -Glise. Because it's a great honor to have been the first American bridgehead in France. <laughs> Madame Renault was not afraid to impose her will locally to make sure the story was told accurately and with due respect to those who fought. When Normandy officials planned a banquet in memory of D-Day without inviting any of the U.S. veterans, she was incensed and demanded that the plans be changed. Uh, Madame Renault loved, loved the Americans. She taught her children to love the Americans. And not only did they love the Americans, but they respected the Americans. And in that way, we got along very well with them. As time went on, she kind of adopted me, and she would call me Sonny. I thought I was a little too old to be a Sonny, but we had a, we had a wonderful relationship. She attended to these graves. We were just utterly fascinated with this woman who, who showed so much respect. Many of us went through the war. Of course, we had to come home and went to college or school or we were working at a job or uh, and got on with our lives, and married and had children, and here's a woman that never forgot. She came to symbolize the reason they fought, the reward for their sacrifices. We owe you our liberation, our soil, our life. We unite in our hearts. Madame Renault served as commander-in-chief of the organization she created, l'Association des Amis des Vétérans Américains. She wrote hundreds of letters to veterans to thank them and to make them aware that the town would welcome them back for ceremonies, reenactments, and honor their accomplishments. She battled with the French government to obtain authorization to reenact the parachute jumps. Madame Renault oversaw the reinvention of her town as the significance of the anniversary grew more and more profound with each passing year. Images of parachutes and monuments to the D-Day invasion could be found everywhere. Paul Renault's design of the church's stained glass windows, complete with images of American paratroopers coming to earth before the loving gaze of Mother Mary, along with insignias of the 82nd and 101st Airborne Divisions, placed the invasion not just in historical, but spiritual context. Streets were renamed in honor of American soldiers and officers. Parachutes were drawn into the town's crest. Gift shops, cafes, and taverns adopted D-Day themes. More and more veterans were regularly returning to saint mary including John Steele, who became a close friend of the Renaults. By the 25th anniversary in 1969, the town had become one colossal monument to America's sacrifices for France in the European campaign of World War II. There was a hint of grief in Madame Renault's speech at the 25th anniversary of D-Day in saint mary Less than a month earlier, John Steele had died of cancer and her own husband, Mayor Renault, had passed away in 1966. My husband, oh, how much he would have enjoyed this wonderful occasion today, predicted in his book that you would come back. The 1969 uh, anniversary was very special because it was the 25th anniversary, so let's say it was the first time there was a massive return of veterans. 
and it was organized by uh, mainly Don Lassen and also Bill Tucker and Bob Murphy. I came to know Madame Raynaud uh, through the planning for this trip. She was ahead of everything in Normandy and all those committees and they had a, uh, uh, I think they had the AVA then, the uh, Ami Veteran American. I think, and she was the head of that. And she was the head of everything. And so when everything that was done, they saw Madame Raynaud first, because she would take care of it and tell them what to do and what not to do. And when they were wrong, she'd tell them they were wrong, too. In 1969, our charter plane flew us from New York to Paris. I had the whole damn bunch right there. I had a, had a chartered bus waiting at the airport. So the charter bus took us to the train terminal in Paris. Uh, I don't remember which one it was, but it took it to the train terminal in Paris, and there was a train sitting there waiting for us, a charter train. Nobody on it but airborne guys, say, 250 of us. We got on that train and went straight to, and that's the picture right there. That's us getting, get, and just having gotten, look at everybody's got their baggage sitting there, and and somebody, that's Maurice up there on the, on a, on a flat car, uh, reading out the housing assignments of the people. She enlisted the help of all three of her sons to find lodging for their American visitors during the anniversary week, a tall order for a small farm town lacking hotels. We decided to put them with, with private people, so we had to find uh, about 200 families around St. Marie's to take them and, uh, and feed them too, whatever. But we had no problem, and we got 200 different homes to get them. The train Madame Raynaud arranged, she arranged it. You know, uh, a year later, I got a bill from the French National Railway for, for that train. And I tell you, the bill was like $20,000 or something, you know. It's a charter train. I contacted Madame Raynaud. She said, send me the bill. She took that bill uh, <laughs> to Paris and made them eat the bill. We never paid a cent for that train. There's nothing she couldn't do. We thanked her for taking care of our comrades at the cemetery now down in Colville at Omaha Beach area. As they became more knowledgeable of Madame Renault's loyalty, the American veterans developed as much respect for her as she had for them. That respect was built on much more than travel arrangements. It had everything to do with her lifelong dedication to care for the graves of those who did not come home and her continuous attention to their families. She had a lot of names that she showed us of men that were killed in our unit and the 505 um, and different regimental combat teams, uh, sections of the, of the 82nd. As the years passed, Madame Renault continued to correspond with veterans and families of those who had fallen. She frequently visited the graves at Omaha Beach and continued to serve as the local ambassador for any and all D-Day anniversary activities. Soon, the invasion's annual commemoration was drawing heads of state from all lands and active military units serving in uniform around the world. Normandy assumed an identity that would forever be associated with freedom and its costs and Saint-Marie-Glis became, as it is today, the epicenter of French appreciation of America. In her later years, Madame Renault wore a bracelet with a parachute charm, so that every night she could go to sleep with a paratrooper close to her heart. And she continued to write letters. Here is an uh, old uh, uh, the German red typewriters at my Mother boat just after the war in 1940. And uh, she, she used it many, many years. She wrote uh, hundreds of letters, many of them for American families. It was possible uh, 20 years after to, to, to buy another one, but I think that she have typed so many letters on this uh, machine that she, she keep it. In the final years of her life, it became a struggle for Madame Renault to visit the Omaha Beach Cemetery. The last five years of my mother's life uh, were uh, kind of difficult because she could not move much. She had a big problem with her legs. Uh, blood circulation in her legs was very bad, so 
she could not go out much. She had to stay in her house. But she was still writing letters to uh, all kinds of people, and, and she still received lots of mail. And uh, the last five years, she was still very active, sometime until the middle of the night. Eventually, Henri Jean had to write the letters for his mother as she softly told him what she wished to say. In 1988, at the age of 89, she went into a coma. After spending so much of her life pouring the contents of her heart into letters and poems, Madame Renault could no longer speak nor respond in any other way. But when one of her beloved American veterans, Bill Tucker, arrived at her bedside and told her he was there for her, he swears he felt her delicate hands squeeze his. One final gesture of thanks to the Americans who had meant so much to her. Tucker's next visit to Saint Marie was to attend her funeral. Inside the great stone church where the images of paratroopers adorn the stained glass. Madame Renault was laid to rest next to her husband in the shadows of the church in the ancient Normandy village of her birth. Engraved on her tomb are the words, Veterans will not forget you. Simone Renaud's room was filled with unfinished writings when she died. Thousands of letters, notes, names, memorabilia, and photographs were stacked everywhere. Henri Jean saved her old red typewriter and many of the letters from America. God forbid it, but supposing it was your boy lying in a lonely soldier's grave in a foreign land half a world away, and she brought to you the feeling that he was amongst friends. Bon ami. In that light, perhaps you can see how much you have done. We are most fortunate. We have been told repeatedly how kind the French people are and how tenderly they care for the graves of the American soldiers. We do not need to be reminded of that. You good folks have proven that to our great satisfaction and comfort. On the 50th anniversary of the invasion in 1994, as world leaders and grain veterans gathered across the Cotentin Peninsula in an arrangement coordinated by Bob Murphy, a helicopter appeared in the sky above St. Mary's. Fresh flower blossoms were released, and they floated down like multicolored parachutes under the shoulders of veterans and among the survivors of D-Day. Their memories had, as the mayor predicted, brought them back. That day at Utah Beach, U.S. President Bill Clinton acknowledged the history that was made a half century earlier, and the Normandy farm girl who spent the second half of her life drawing America and France together in the aftermath of the war that forever changed the world. The people of this coast understand just beyond this beach is the town of saint mer Eglise. There, brave American paratroopers floated into a tragic ambush on D-Day, and there the survivors rallied to complete their mission. The mayor's wife, Simone Renaud, wrote the families of the Americans who had fought and died to free her village. And she kept on writing them every week for the rest of her life until she died just six years ago. Her son, Henri Jean Renaud, carries on her vigil now, and he has vowed never to forget, saying, I will dedicate myself to the memory of their sacrifice for as long as I live. Today, her sons are retired from successful business careers. Henri Jean, who took over the family pharmacy, still lives in saint mary Paul and Maurice dutifully return each year to help find lodging for those who flock to Normandy every June for the week of commemorations, reenactments, parades, and festivities including an annual dinner party for the veterans and for occasional visitors from Locust Valley, New York. Gerard and Giselle Lecoeur always help prepare the annual party. Yeah, I believe my parents would be extremely uh, proud and uh, pleased to see that we kept the uh, flame of friendship between uh, the American veterans and, 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 and Normandy alive and uh, we're still very active, uh, my brothers and I. So they will pass it on to the younger generations when we are no more, and others yet unborn, and so on. Thus I promise you, heart to heart, that the French people will never, never forget.
from a very terrible situation, uh, it leads to a great friendship over the years because since 1944 now it's 61 years of relationship with his family and others and like with the veterans. So it's, it's a quite amazing uh, what happened. Today, although the number of D-Day veterans able to make the trip is dwindling, thousands of other visitors, generations removed from World War II, come to Normandy every year to see the great battles and parachute jumps reenacted and to catch a glimpse or share a word or two with veterans who actually fought in it. We have passed on the story of your saga to our young ones, and your bravery has become legendary. More and more persons from the younger generations come to salute the monuments, including one that pays tribute to Mayor Renault, positioned on the perimeter of the town square. On the steeple, they see the mannequin portraying John Steele, his parachute fluttering in the late spring breeze. They tore the museum and lay wreaths beneath the stone that identifies kilometer zero in the march to victory in Europe. And they come to walk the rows of graves where the heroes sleep near Omaha Beach, their second place of rest. And a few among those who visit the town each year, veterans like Tucker, Murphy, Piper, and Lassen, clear a little time in their schedules and drive to Saint-Germain-de-Ternebout to pay their respects to the woman they credit for having narrowed the ocean between their two nations, who herself now rests in peace, knowing her greatest mission in life, like theirs, was accomplished. To her, these American men were sons. To them, she was, and always will be, the mother of Normandy. <laughs>